How do you develop resilience when pursuing the career in which you are desperate to succeed in? Also, if you're a songwriter, how can you trigger ideas for new material when you have writer's block? We'll provide some answers for you in today's episode. Welcome to Half Hour Mentor. It's Ian Cleverdon here, and welcome to the audio podcast series designed to help anyone who wishes to further themselves with their personal hobbies and professional development, with a focus in this series on creative arts. In this episode, I catch up with Scottish singer-songwriter Finlay Napier. Finn is widely regarded as one of the finest performers on the UK music scene. This fact was reinforced when he was the first solo act ever to be nominated for Live Act of the Year at the Scots Trad Music Awards in 2018. Tirelessly creative, he has been touring and releasing music since the early noughties, firstly with groundbreaking trad folk band Back of the Moon, then with new folk pioneers Finlay Napier and the Barroom Mountaineers. His breakthrough solo album, VIP, Very Interesting Persons, was produced by legendary singer-songwriter Boo Hewardine and achieved number two in the Telegraph's top folk albums of 2014. He's since gone on to release two further critically acclaimed solo albums and a number of varied collaborative projects. His latest work is with folk rock supergroup The Magpie Arc. If you're not familiar with Finn's wide-ranging work, I've put together a Spotify playlist of some of my favourite songs from his extensive solo and collaborative catalogue. You'll discover during this interview why he's considered one of the best raconteurs and engaging performers on the live circuit, and also what else he does beyond live performance to continuously improve and to pay the bills. Let's have a listen. Finley Napier, welcome to Half Hour Mentor. Thank you for having me. Oh, absolute pleasure. All right, let's go back, as I do with all of my guests, to your teenage years. What was the first job you wanted to do or career you wanted to pursue? Um, it's kind of funny, actually. I did one of those, um, like a test thing that you had to fill out. And the answer that I got was antique stealer. Um, and Lovejoy was on the telly at that time. And so there was this point where I wanted to be an antique stealer. And then the person at school that I had said, well, that's not going to work, really. What you've done here is you've had a career in mind, and when you filled out the form, it's landed on what you want. Because so, you're a fan of Lovejoy. Yeah, yeah, basically. So, which may be the case. Anyway, I did it again, and I think I got a journalist or something like that. But it was kind of strange, actually, because I played music all the time, and I loved music, and my mum was a professional musician. But weirdly, I just didn't think I was good enough to be a professional musician. And it wasn't until my high school music teacher, Christine Jackson, said, I think you should go to this course at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. It was called the RSAMD. It was a, a, a Bachelor of Arts in Traditional Music. I think I said to my guidance teacher, um, I think I'm going to do that. And she was like, there's no way you can do that. You're not, you're not good enough. And my music teacher went absolutely mental. Like, um, I think it's the first time I ever heard a teacher swear. Wow. Was this the careers advisor that said that it was the wrong decision for you? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, it was quite strange, actually. All I had ever done was was hang out, you know, with musicians, and I loved music, I loved playing music, and by this point I was writing songs and everything. You know, I'm talking here at like fourth, fifth, and sixth year of school, so I had already started, I think I started writing songs maybe in fifth or sixth year, and I was playing guitar, and I had a band, and we were out gigging, and I was making money, I mean, I remember the first time I got money for playing and talking to my friend who'd worked in the spa in Grand Town all day Saturday, given up his whole Saturday, and he'd made 20 quid and I'd made 30 quid and all I'd done is hung around one of the bars in Carbridge playing music and had made five pounds more than him. And I was like, this is quite a good job, <laughs> you know? <laughs> 25 quid oh my god oh like, the riches the riches the riches but, totally yeah so when was the first time that music was a real sort of started to be a passion for you then obviously you said your mum was a, a professional musician but when for you did you think that was going to be the case because often you tend to rebel against what your parents do as a, a job i tie it all back to um a thing called the fish which is a kind of music camp but it was, it was a music camp at that point where um, Fesh Spay was the Fesh that I went to. There's quite a lot of them all over Scotland, and it's the, the governing body is called Fesh and then Gale. It means festival. But basically, you go there as a kid and you learn about Gaelic culture through the medium of music. So um, we would 
all learn like Gaelic songs and then we would have one instrument each. And I got really into playing the bowron and I got to playing the guitar there as well. And then usually you'd pick one other instrument. But it was the, the thing that got me was not so much the music, which I loved, but the hanging out and the talking nonsense and just the, the hanging out and that camaraderie. And then as I got better playing music with other people, the session scene was just, just blew my mind. And because my mum was involved in running the fish, there would be the concert and then people would come back to our house for drinks and a session. So I would see sessions and it just completely blew my mind. The fish had an issue at that point. I, I, they probably still have this problem, but not maybe not quite so as severe, but they would lose kids aged about 14. So the, kid, the, the fish was for all high school aged children, but when people turned 14, they just left. So they held a special fish in Fort William with Jim Hunter, Doogie Pincock and Ishbel McCaskill. Ishbel McCaskill, a very famous Gaelic singer. Uh, Doogie Pincock now runs the Centre for Excellence in Traditional Music. And Jim Hunter um, is a singer-songwriter um, and he's now a guitar teacher in, uh, uh, at Malig High School. Uh, he's the guitar teacher there. But he was at that point, he was the support act for Run Rig, toured all over Europe. You know, he was a really well-known one man with a guitar, telling funny stories, singing songs. Yeah. So yeah. funnily enough. That like, sounds familiar. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't that sound familiar? It's almost <laughs> like, it's almost like I just uh, stole his entire thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, but that's almost me mentor number one for you, really. By the oh, no, it, it. like absolutely is. Yeah. yeah. He, and he absolutely was mentor number one. I mean, there's no doubt about it. So I, I met Jim and hung out with him. There and Doogie and Ishbel were fantastic as well. But I also met a bunch of people from all over Scotland, the same age as me, who were a lot better than me at traditional music. But then I sang on that for the first time. It's the first time I'd ever sang in front of anyone other than maybe my parents. And I just remember Doogie Pincock going, You need to get rid of that bowden and you need to start singing. And Jim Hunter going, And in order to do that, you need to get better at playing the guitar because your guitar playing is not very good. He didn't use that word, but he, <laughs> he <used> that word. <laughs> so get your guitar playing better. And then he came to the face the next year. My guitar playing was better, and Jim was like, "Have you written any songs?" Uh, no. Right. Well, because next time I see you, why don't you write some songs? So next time I seen him, he was like, "Oh, did you ever write any songs?" I was like, "Yeah, I've got four. <laughs> four, four songs." And I just remember, and he was like, "Right, that's really good." Um, so yeah, that's kind of where it started. So yeah, Jim Hunter was most definitely my first mentor and was the person that, that started me writing songs. And it's pretty amazing actually, had just the kind of the random nature of it. And so the face, you know, was obviously there to promote Gaelic culture. But what it ended up doing in me is leading me down this singer songwriter route. But the other great thing that happened at a face was when you got a bit older, they gave you a little bit of extra responsibility at that time. And so I would go to my first choice lesson. But for my second and third choice, I would go and help one of the other teachers. So I actually learned loads about how to teach. It's one of the key things that you do in the songwriting side, which we'll explore in a short while. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I, so I kind of like the two things grew side by side, and they were there was not a lot of um, formal learning in either of them. It was all kind of practical on the job. And I realised very quickly that you know, for example, Jim as a guitar teacher, if I was in helping him. He just needed me to shut up, tune guitars, be a little bit encouraging where someone needed it, and to go to the photocopier as soon as he said, can you photocopy that, you know? Like, it was really straightforward. But I learned lots because I kept my mouth shut, and I just listened, and I saw how he structured things. I could see how you could break something down into its component parts and teach it, and then through seeing that, that was really helpful as well. And he happened to be an excellent teacher, and that's another thing, you know, as I sort of move through my career, everybody that I look at that mentored me is usually someone who is an exceptional teacher as well. That's interesting because it's a theme that's come a lot through this series in terms of just really working at the bottom end. So supporting, tuning the guitars, watching the, the people who are actually running the sessions and learning from what they do, because that in itself is a form of mentorship, even though sometimes that might not be that obvious. Uh -huh. Well, I remember being teaching it something years later and having a kid who was really good guitar player and a, a pretty decent singer and I asked him to go and photocopy something for me and he said no and I was like but do you understand what's going on here 
And he kind of laughed at me, and I was like, I sort of laughing at him, going, dude, like, just go to the photocopy and photocopy these things. And he was doing stuff like showing off and playing his guitar stuff to some of the kids. And I was like, he's actually missing a little piece here. And I explained to him what his duties were. And he didn't, I mean, he wasn't interested at all. He just thought he was there for a kind of skype and a hangout and to sort of show off to the to the girls and stuff. But I was like, maybe, maybe I should have been more like that guy. <laughs> but the reality is I was a bit of a, I was quite a goody two-shoes and I could see that if I did a good job, it would lead to something. I could see a path forming. Let's go back to that first song you wrote then, because you said you started doing that at an early age. Well, how did you approach sitting down to write your first song? I mean, you've probably written thousands, I would imagine now, but what was the first one like and how did you go about it? Do you know what's really mad is I I don't know how I did it. And I have, I heard it not, well, you know, a few years ago I heard it because I found a tape that had it on it. It's not that bad. Like if somebody brought that along to me at a songwriting workshop, I'd be like, oh, right, cool. This kid's really got something. It's really good. Like it's got a chorus. It's got a good melody. It's pretty decent. It's kind of remarkable as a first song by someone who's just been, whose only guidance was you should go and write a song, you know? Mm. Can you remember um, what it? Can you remember your first song? What it's called and how it goes? It's called it's called Outside, and it is the um, it is the story of a girl rejected by her parents because she got pregnant, and the sort of killer line just before it, where it drops into the final chorus, is a baby clutched in her arms, <laughs> and then it's it's cold outside because they've thrown her outside and it's cold outside, and they welcome her back in when they see the little baby. It's a lovely story. Heartwarming little little ditty about teenage pregnancy. I think I had my heart set on being a kind of folk singer. So I was singing about things that really mattered, man. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah the, the, there's a story there. There's a, a social social sort of backstory to it as well. Yeah, uh, I know, it's quite funny. <laughs> so where did it go from there then? So what was the lead out into the professional world? So I went and did the traditional music degree at the uh, RSAMD, which is now the Conservatoire of Scotland. That was actually very hard because I think the idea that I had in my mind that it was that it was going to be a fish that lasted three years. Um, and the reality was not like that. I struggled quite a bit in my first year. Um, I did not get on with my tutor very well. I was a bit young, I think, maybe to go to university. I think I was one of those people who could have done with a year out. But by the time I got to third year, I actually was really enjoying it. And I really liked the researching that I was doing into folk songs and loved. I really liked the library, hanging out in the library and, and reading these songs and stuff. So that was really cool. It was a good time and I met lots of great people. I met my wife. Oh, you know, so it was uh, it was pretty. It, it was a it was a really brilliant thing. And then I met Simon McCarroll, um, who was the, the year below me at the the RCS. And I'd had a, a band while I was there, a, a trio, and that trio kind of fell apart. And my wife Gillian and Simon McCarroll and my brother Hamish were in a band. Had made started a band called Back of the Moon. And they'd entered the Young Folk Awards, the Radio 2 Young Folk Awards. Um, and when my band broke up, they asked me to join. So I ended up joining uh, the band that became Back of the Moon. Um, and that was kind of the start of touring and, and gigging for me, really. And when I left university, I think I was unemployed. I think I was on the dole for maybe nine months or something. And then that was me away gigging and teaching, basically. <laughs> So was it a blend between gigging and teaching then? So it's interesting to know because probably quite a few of the listeners will be going, well, how do you take that leap of faith into going full-time professional in music? Well, the money was so bad on the dole <laughs> that, actually, that would you believe there was more money in folk music at that point? And I, I got a job uh, working at in a, in a restaurant as well. So between that, it kind of kept me afloat. Uh, washing dishes and then there was enough work with music and teaching and the teaching work just came in it was like kind of community teaching I mean the, the joke about this course at the RCS um, was that I remember our teacher saying to us the course leader Joe Miller the one of the things we're going to train you guys for is to be community musicians so that you can go into the community work in the community and use the skills that you've learned here and the folk music to 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 make your living 
there's no way I'm ever going to be doing that, Joe, because I am going to be a traditional singer. I'm going to be like Dick Gochen or Christy Moore, uh, <laughs> <laughs> standing on a stage and telling my stories and singing my songs. Um, but what's ended up happening was exactly what Joe said. There was loads and loads of people wanted guitar lessons, latterly ukulele lessons. In fact, Last week, I taught ukulele and guitar in Aaron High School for a day. I taught um, songwriting um, and singing and Kaylee dancing with Gillian in three schools in Aaron on Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. Um, so, like, exactly what Joe Miller planned is what happened. <laughs> yeah. So the teaching really still forms a, a very important part of what you do. Oh, absolutely. It's a huge part. And some years it'll be my income will be more from playing and some years it will be more from teaching. But usually they sit about 50-50. I've never, um, I don't think I've ever had a year where I've where I've only had income from one or the other, you know. And yeah, just, just and I, I've learned most of that on the job. There was a guy called Stephen Deasley and he did a workshop on teaching. I think it was for Hands Up for Trad. So a whole load of us went to this workshop to see what you would have to say was really really good but one of the, the at the end he did a kind of Q&A session and he said how much effort would you put into doing a gig compared to how much effort you would put into doing teaching I was kind of hinting at the fact that I put in loads of work into a gig but hardly any work into teaching and he was like that if you want to enjoy your teaching work you need to put as much effort into it as the effort you put into doing a gig or you won't enjoy it and the people won't enjoy it so you need to start doing that um, or he didn't say you need to start doing that. He just said that. But I went, I need to start doing that. I see what he's talking about here. If you actually dig in and do a really good job and put in that effort, what you get back will be as good as what you get back when you play a blinder of a gig. Um, and that was a really solid bit of advice that's kind of lodged in my head. And also, what do you do if you get offered really well-paid work for doing some teaching, but you don't really fancy taking that on? Don't do it. But I need the money. You don't need the money that bad. But I do need the money that bad. No, you don't. You actually don't. Because something else good will come along. Your diary will fill up with something else good, or something amazing will land in your lap if you put the work in. You know. Yeah. Um, if you so, if you build it, they will come. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That was, I guess, a leap of faith there. Um, and I, but I think it was a, a worthwhile one. Well, that brings us really nicely to the present then, because I was going to ask you about all the different solo collaborative projects that you do musically and thinking, how on earth do you balance all of those? And now I'm just learning you've got the education and the teaching to fit in as well. You know, uh -huh. And of course, we'll talk about the songwriting sessions in a moment. But how do you balance all of that? So, you know, you've got your solo career, you've got the Magpie Arc at the moment that's going through, you've done story song scientists, uh, you know, you've got all oh, these different projects that's going on. How do you plate spin all of those things and know when to do what? Uh, Google Calendar. And I am getting a lot better at managing my time, but there's a lot of time management goes on. The Magpie Art was particularly mad because they're based in Sheffield. So quite a lot of the Magpie Art is just driving to Sheffield in order to rehearse. Um, you, live so that, on, you live on the Isle of Arran. <laughs> and I live on the Isle of Arran, yeah. Yeah, I don't live in Leeds <laughs> or, or, or anywhere or anywhere like convenient to Sheffield. Um, in fact, I lived in Glasgow when I first started with that band and I've just, I've moved, uh, effectively moved two hours further away. No, an hour and a half further away. So three hours extra travel time I've added. But um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you can do so much stuff online, like we're doing this online right now. And there was a time where if you went, had to go for a meeting, you had to go into town. I teach at the RCS, I teach songwriting there. And they've asked a few times, would you like, to, could you come and do your thing face to face, your, your, your hour a week face to face? And I just said no, because uh, when I live, even when I lived in Glasgow, it added an hour and a half onto the one hour of teaching that I was paid for. Um, so I just went no. <laughs> I'll do it, but I'll do it on Zoom so I can fit it into the rest of the day and fit stuff around it. So, yeah, I'll just look at a day, I'll plan it out, and I'm learning how to say no um, a lot more. The Story Song Scientist is really good because Meg and I work very quickly, and so we work in little blocks of time. So, for example, we wrote the second EP in two songwriting sessions 
So that was like less than two days that we wrote it. And then we recorded it by sending stuff backwards and forwards. Um, and her brother assembled it. And then we had a day or two of rehearsals before we went out on tour. Two days of rehearsals, I think we had. But yeah, we did a lot of personal practice before bringing ourselves together to do that. And the same the same applies to the magpie art. You know, things appear to come together quite quickly, but that's because everybody's doing loads of work behind the scenes. Hmm. Um, You'll look for that gap in your calendar and think, OK, if there's this project that's coming later in the year, have I got a week free or those days free uh-huh. that you can do that? OK. I'm not doing a lot of solo work this year. I'm waiting till 2024. And I was focusing on the Magpie arc for this year and just being living on Aaron, making the, the transition from, from the city to, to living on, a, on an island. And just in case anyone thinks that Aaron's remote, if I, I can get on the ferry on the first boat in the morning and I can be in Glasgow Central Station by 10.30 and I can be in uh, London, Euston by 2.30. So... Although I'm on an island, I'm not that far away from the rest of the world. Aaron's, you know, it's in is in the Firth of Clyde, between the Mull of Kintyre and and North Ayrshire. It's not uh, it's not Lewis, or, or or Shetland. Do you know what I mean? Uh, one of the stories I keep getting told is, "Oh my God, you've moved to Aaron." I mean, Chris Drever, he lived in Shetland, and I think he found it quite difficult. And I'm like, "Yes, that's Shetland." It's so far away. It's in a little box on the map. Aaron <laughs> is 45 minutes from the mainland and there's five ferries a day, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, a bit, it's a wee bit different. Um, Just a little bit easier. It's yeah. a little bit easier. We still have our problems, but it's a, it, with, with, with breaking down ferries, but we, we are marginally closer. Um, yeah, so just like in, in terms of bouncing things, I, I noticed that I had one solo gig um, and I thought I'd be able to sort of do all the practicing for that in half a day. But actually, in order to get my 245 minute solo gig up and running, it probably takes a day and a half of working on the songs and making sure everything's good. Cause I've, I have a, like, I have, cause I have standards that I want to maintain. Um, and I have a bunch of songs that I want to rotate. So I'm not always doing the same. So sometimes I have to relearn all my, well, not all, but many of my old songs. But if I'm regularly doing solo gigs, I don't need to rehearse very much at all. Like they're they're right there at the front of my mind. But like, yeah, like if you said, will you come down and do a gig next week? It would take me about a day and a half to get up and running. So I'd have to go, right, I'll get the eight o'clock boat and I'll work back from what time you need me there and then how much time I need. And then I'll go, well, I have to do these jobs. So I'll fit the rehearsals in maybe three days beforehand. I'll do a little bit and then I'll make a note of the ones that were in terrible shape and do them again on on the day or whatever yeah 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 proper proper planning so google calendar absolutely your favorite uh, your favorite tool yes it yeah. gets it, and it's and it, like the magpie arc have one and jillian my wife has one uh and this room that i'm in right now which i'm no longer officially a part of they have one as well which we which the, the listeners won't hear this which just failed that was uh that was a legendary uh recording uh, engineer and producer Mark Freegard there that just, just crashed our session. Um, <laughs> Excellent. Well, let's look at the songwriting side of things then. So uh, obviously the sessions that you run, you said, you know, you run them online, you do face-to-face ones, because I mean, you collaborate with other songwriters as well, like mm-hmm. like sort of Boo Boo Huadine uh, and many others. What, what do you most enjoy about doing those sessions? I think it's the sort of just before them, there's like a kind of terrifying fear of will we actually get anything done here? And then like I did one and I did one here this morning uh, working with a guy. And yeah, I find myself sometimes just before someone comes in uh, going like, oh, my God, what are we actually going to do here? How are we going to get anything? And then it's like the guy's left and there's three songs recorded, <laughs> three new songs. Yeah, it's really good. I think just trusting uh, in the process and having lots of things in the back pocket. So when Boo and I work with groups, we often set them tasks. In fact, we always set them tasks. Some of them are really easy. You know, some of them are like, I want you to go to your bookshelf and find three books with interesting titles. And I want you to write those titles down on a piece of paper. Go. You know, and then you come back, right, pick one of those titles, write a song about, write a song that uses that title. So you're not writing a song about the book, you're just using the title. And and then it sort of builds up from there. Um, if I'm writing with someone, I'll do exactly that and 
I think I've wrote one with Jen Butterworth that I think might be on her new album, Sending Empty Postcards Home. I think it was called that. I can't quite remember, but that was really good because we'd written a couple of songs earlier in the session. And then I think we just started with a blank page and it happened really, really quickly. Um, and we wrote this really lovely song about, you know, sending empty postcards home. Postcards aren't empty. You are writing on them, but they're just full of nothing because you can't fully express how you're feeling. You're just saying, oh, everything's great. Having a lovely time out here. You know, yeah. but actually I'm not because I'm missing you terribly. Yeah. Uh, so that kind of thing. Um, and it was just a really nice concept and a good title and it sung really well. And I, I feel mm. like we maybe wrote that in about 20 minutes. What's the biggest challenge, do you think, for um, in, for you helping emerging songwriters? You know, what are the big challenges that you come across? You mentioned obviously it's a. Sometimes you think, is it going to work? But it tends to, and it did this morning from the session. Uh-huh. Did. But you know, what challenges do you actually see and face? That's actually really hard to to think of because it's. I don't find it challenging. I find it really easy. I think the biggest challenge is actually overcoming my own worries about what might happen. Actually, when I get there and I shut up and I listen. It's immediately obvious to me what can be done with a song. As soon as I hear it, I know exactly what needs to be done. How do you know that? I think it's because I've spent on a huge amount of time listening to music. As a student, as a teenager, um, as an adult, I still listen to loads of music all the time. I've got uh, Apple Music send me 20 new songs and sign up, new music mix it's called. I listen to those 20 songs every week, 20 new things that I haven't heard before. And I sort of weed through them and pick out the ones I like the best and save them to a playlist, which I then listen to occasionally. Um, I've got another playlist that I save of things where I just hear a sound in a song that I like, just like an arrangement or a guitar sound or a piano or just like, or like some just like sounds that it's called sounds I like. <laughs> and it's just a random playlist of, of just like weird sounding things. And I, so I could go to a producer or an engineer, listen to this. I really like that. But yeah, I listen a lot and I can kind of, there is a feel in a song when it is working and there is a feel in a song when it doesn't work. And I, when it doesn't work, I call it flatlining. So all that I'm listening for is that the song has a kind of shape to it. And if I hear it flatline, then it jumps out at me. And then similarly with the lyrics, if I hear something that doesn't ring true to the story or to the overall feeling of the song, it, lo- it leaps out at me. I can't hear anything else except that. And that's what I'll focus on to, to work with the client on. Um, and it's, I don't know why I find that very easy and very obvious. Um, just when I sit and, and listen through to things, it, it, it's kind of a, ama- it's kind of, yeah. But I suppose as well, it's just my taste too, you know, like, so it comes down that somebody else could listen to the same song and not hear what I'm hearing. And um, but I hear stuff like that super fast and, I usually know how to change it as well. That's really good to know. Uh, uh, that's excellent. We talked about uh, mentor number one earlier on. Who else has mentored you or has been an influence in your songwriting over the years? Jim Hunter was was definitely the first guy. And then I stopped writing songs for quite a long period of time, mostly when I was out touring with Back of the Moon because that band was a traditional Scottish folk band, bagpipes, fiddle. My brother played piano and flutes and whistles. And I played guitar and sang um, and I didn't really write anything. And I hit a real sort of bad writing spot there. And we made an album at Watercolour Music and Art Gower. And we were working with this brilliant engineer uh, called Nick Turner. Um, and Nick Turner is a brilliant engineer, not just because he's good at his job, but he's very, he's just a very nice person. If you are about to make your first album, that is one of the studio and you're not used to working in the studio, that is the studio I would recommend because he's just so great at making people feel comfortable, which is very important. We were do- making our second album. We got a lot of work done up there and Nick remembered recording a song of mine that had won a competition and he said, are you still writing? And I said, oh God, if, oh, I haven't written for ages. I'm in a bit of a dry spell. He said, have you considered co-writing? Well, yeah, maybe, you know, and I didn't do anything about it. And I was talking to Jim on the phone and said, Nick Turner said that I should go up and, and try and write some songs with him. And Jim was like, well, why didn't you just do it? And I think literally just lifted the phone and called Nick and said, actually, Nick, I'd like to take you up on that. So I got the bus up to Ardgower with my guitar and a bag of coffee and a bottle of wine. 
And we sat in his kitchen and at the end of the first night, we'd written four songs. <laughs> and by the time I left the next, the, the, the day after that, so it was up for a night, a day, and then a bit of a day. And we went and recorded it. I think we recorded six songs. What were the tri- the ideas that triggered those songs? Because that I had was almost like, like starting again, wasn't it? Yeah, it was funny. The, I had songs that were kind of finished, but they just went nowhere. And Nick came out with this brilliant line, which I use all the time, which is reversing backwards. I'd written a whole verse, reversing, we're reversing. And then I written the next, then it'd be a chorus and it'd be great. Yeah. And then there'd be another verse, going backwards, going backwards. <laughs> and it was just like, I'd written the same verse, but just used different words. And I just couldn't, second verse syndrome, people call it as well. But I loved Nick's way of calling it reversing backwards. It's like the song is going nowhere. So we would very, we would make a story up. We'd invent a character and then we would write the song to the end with that and then we would improve on the song afterwards. So we made two albums under the pseudonym Queen and Anne's Revenge and then I used a lot of that material that, that Nick and I wrote to make the Finley Maker and the Bar and Mountaineers. Those two albums are mostly songs by Nick and I. Um, I don't think there's anything I wrote myself. I, mean, I think they're all co-writes with Nick. So that was great, like really, really great. We had such a good time. We had such a good laugh doing it as well. It was just a hoot, but we were learning loads about songwriting. Um, and then after the second album came out there, I kind of hit a wall again, but I didn't know what to do. Nick was really busy. He rebuilt watercolour music into what it is now, which is a very impressive facility. And I think Lucy, my daughter, was about to be born. And I was speaking to a guy called Simon Tumir, who runs Hands Up for Trad. And he said, well, what are you going to do next? You've made the first... Barnum Metton Years album, the second one, what's happening next? And I just put my head in my hands and I was like, I just don't know what to do. And he said, oh, Creative Scotland are doing mentoring funding. You should get a mentor. And I was like, oh, that's a good idea. Never heard of mentors, despite having had two of them. Um, <laughs> at least two of them, probably more. But uh, so I spoke to Simon and Percy, who run, who run that, and uh, we wrote an application that got accepted. And I was going to work with a guy called Joe Echo. Uh, and Joe Echo called me up and said, listen, there's something going on. I don't think I'm going to be able to do it. And I can't tell you why not. I'm really, really sorry. And I was like, listen, it's fine. You know, just whenever you get time. And he's like, look, I've got to be honest. I don't think I'm going to have time. I've landed a job and I can't tell you about it. But I will call you. And then eventually he did call me. He called me to say he was the lead singer in, in excess. <laughs> 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 so he's called Kieran Grubbin. Uh, uh, Kieran Gribbon, sorry. Oh, so funny, man. So he was like, and that's why I've moved to Australia. They've moved my whole family. We've got sticks. We've left um, Northern Ireland and we've moved to Australia. So I can't help you. Good luck finding someone to work with you. But I did find someone. If, uh, um, in fact, it was really brilliant how it happened. I was talking to Gillian, my wife, about who could be a mentor and she said, well, what is it you want to do? I said, well, I want to write songs for people like Eddie Reader. And remember that time we supported that guy, Boo Hewardine? I want to be able to do a gig like at that gig that Boo did where I'm telling stories and I'm singing songs. Um, and he writes songs for Eddie Reader, you know. I said, and the other thing that he does is that he teaches songwriting. So that means he'll be a really good teacher. And I'd like to be a really good songwriting teacher too. And Jill was like, do you not think maybe you should ask Boo Hewardine then? <laughs> so what you're saying is there's one man who is also a good teacher that fills all the three things you want to do. Why not ask him? So I did. And he was delighted. And that's been one of the most amazing things because he's he's like my best mate. And we've done so much work together from the first album we did together, VIP, that we co-wrote to the Bird and a Wire online songwriting workshops that we did and then the face-to-face songwriting things that we do. We're about to do another one called Stages. He's running it with Maniac Moore and I'm coming in as a songwriting tutor. And that's an incredible project where it's like, who is going to take 12 people from writing the songs right the way through the entire process, recording the music and taking the music onto the stage. So. Mm. You know, like I think that would have been a brilliant thing for me as a as a young singer songwriter. I think it would have been incredible. One of the great things about teaching the songwriting, especially, is just like you see, you get people who come in and their songs are very cluttered and there's lots of chord changes and they're complex and 
most of what Boo and I do is go is make things much more simpler and give the songs a lot more space and focus in on the story so that the whole song runs from start to finish and uh, and work on their melodies so that the melody is a bit more interesting and you know and teach them those skills and they would have been really useful to have early on you know and also just those tricks those not those tricks those tasks you know like I don't know what I'm going to write about today I need something to do oh well here is a task like I just did one just before you you called I, I did a quick one I'm doing this thing called I Heart Songwriting Club which is an online songwriting club and every week you get given a thing so the one I did there was called Crystal Ball look into the future and write a song about the future so I wrote that's what I did I just wrote that right there very quickly um, and I'll submit that and then all the other people in my group will listen to it and comment, and I'll listen to all of their songs and comment on theirs. Yeah, it's a really lovely thing, but it keeps me busy, which is the reason important. You know? Yeah, that's great. And I mean, there's so many different ways of triggering off songs, which obviously we can't cover in half an hour. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it'd be, but that's where attending one of your workshops definitely comes in, and all the details will be in the show notes uh, on how to find find that out. Time is moving on, as it always does. Uh-huh. And uh, I've just got one final question, Finn, that I ask all of my guests, and that is, knowing what you know now, go back to that teenage self of sitting in sessions with your mum and so on. What one piece of advice would you give that younger self, knowing what you know now? I think it would be to have more confidence in my abilities, because I don't think I was as confident in my songwriting as I could have been. And I think maybe I could have made more of that sooner. I think if I'd perhaps not even worked on it much more, I think just had the confidence to go out and do more gigs and be a bit more pushy about it. There was other people around me that thought I should be putting more energy into other things. And I foolishly believed them. Well, maybe not fully. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter. It's what's what's done is done. But I think had I maybe just been a bit more like, no, I know what I'm doing here and just carried on. I think I, my career may have gone in a different direction because I think I was onto something early on and somewhere along the way I, I, I hit a wall. And it's, I think it's because I wasn't doing what I, I wasn't doing what I should have been doing. If that makes sense. That's it. Confidence is one of the key things that uh, you know comes up time after time, and and really sort of following your dream that little bit more, but with that extra bit of support. Uh-huh. Fantastic. So, thanks ever so much for spending the time with us, and just those great lessons there. Um, for our listeners, where can they find out more about you? Um, well, I have a website, but the best thing to do actually is to sign up to my newsletter, which is which you can do at www.findlaynapier.com or if you can't spell my name, www.fnapier.com, <laughs> which is probably the easier one to go to, to be honest. Or, or go in the show notes for the podcast. Or go in the show notes, aye. But the newsletter is a great thing because that kind of keeps you up to date of everything I've got going throughout the whole of the, the year all the random things from songwriting workshops to magpie art gigs to um, a crowd funder I'm going to be launching soon as well. Great. Finn, thanks very much for spending this time with us on Half Hour Mental. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you. If you've listened to the other episodes in this series so far, can you spot the theme that's developed throughout? Teaching. Whether that's through teaching alongside or leading up to success in my guest's field of creativity – or even being inspired by a particular teacher at a young age. Finn's enthusiasm and humour is so infectious. I've worked with him previously in a sound engineering capacity. When you're a live performer, you have to put a lot of trust in the person that's controlling the sound, so therefore you need to quickly build a great working relationship between you. In my opinion, Finn is among the best musicians to work with in this respect, and having heard his stage banter many times, I just knew he'd make a great guest on my mentoring series. Huge thanks go to him for agreeing to the interview. However, that's not all. I did my usual quick-fire question round with him, as I've done with other guests in this series, and his hilarious responses can be heard in the short bonus episode, which will be available the day after this one is released. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the series wherever you get your pods and review the back catalogue. You can leave feedback about the episode through social media by searching for Half Hour Mentor or via the email link in the show notes, where you'll also find links to Finn's work and the Spotify playlist I've created. Thanks for joining us, and until next time, bye for now. Bye for now.